Now, the evidence in Table 1 may still leave you wondering. It left me wondering and sputtering when I first saw it in a workshop. You may ask yourself, wait, isn't that kind of a tautology? 25 portfolios of size to book to market explained by three factors that are also size and book to market? No, it's not, but that takes a while to digest. Uh, you may ask yourself, isn't this just an APT? The R squareds are high, so there's a huge factor structure. That may be right. But if so, you may think, well, so what? I can explain size and book to market with size and book to market. How is that useful for other things? Well, that's the key element that makes the Fama and French model so useful. Not how it works on size to book to market, but how this model is useful in understanding other puzzles. That's what the CAPM was useful for. Not for explaining the market portfolio with the market portfolio, but how all the other anomalies of its day were explained by market betas. So let's go on and see the real important part of this paper, which is how does um, the size and book-to-market factors do in explaining a, a zoo full of uh, other uh, uh, puzzles. So let's think about the question. Uh, I'll ask you to think about your intuition. Should you buy stocks that have strong five years of sales growth, that are doing great and their sales has been improving every year for the last five years, like, say, Google? Or should you buy stocks that have had disastrous declines in sales? All the, the, the ones that used to be big and now are barely selling anything at all. Stocks like, say, Sears. Which is the better stock? Well, if you read the Fama and French paper, or if you thought a little harder about it, you would see the trap. <laughs> the trap is, no, you don't want to buy the strong sales growth stock. You want to buy the stocks that have had disastrous sales declines. Why is that? because of the evidence. There's no th it's not about theory, it's about evidence. And Fama and French show us the evidence. So once again, they've split stocks into 10 different portfolios. Every June, they look at the sales performance of every stock, and they put them into ones who have had high, the ones whose sales have really been growing, the Googles of the world, and ones that are low, the ones that have had disastrous sales performance, the Searses of the world and look, look at their average returns, 47, 63, 70, 68, 70, 89, 103. In fact, you earn twice as much rate of return, 1% per month, rather than half a percent per month, by investing in the sales dogs. The facts of life are that these have bounced back and given you a good stock return more often than those have kept growing. Uh, this is a classic case of, of what we in a business school call the good stock versus good company fallacy. Of course, everybody knows that Google's a great stock. The price has already been bid up, and therefore you can't buy and make a great stock return going forward. You have to bear risk if you want to make money. Oh, you might say, I, I knew that all along, but beta should explain it. Companies that are in real trouble, if the market goes down, they're going to tank. So shouldn't these have higher uh, market betas, therefore explaining the higher premium? That would have been a great answer, too. The fact is here as well, no. Once again, the CAPM has failed us, and these bad, these bad sales growth companies don't, in fact, have higher market betas. So let's look at the Fama French three-factor model. What happens if we use the three-factor model to explain these average returns. And that's in the next table. That's table three of Fama and French. Remember, expected returns rose from left to right, so we're looking for a pattern of betas that rise from left to right. Once again, market betas don't do anything for us. They're all 1.00. So there's no spread in market. It is not true that these guys go down more when the market goes down. The S betas do a little bit. They have a kind of a U-shaped uh, U-shape to them, which isn't helping our, our trend from the left to the right. The, pro the extremes of any distribution are the small stocks, because small stocks do wild things. But the H betas, minus 0 0.092120385050. Look at that strong pattern. The, 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 the sales dogs are moving strongly with the value stocks. Is that spread in H betas enough to explain the average returns? Well, there we can look at the intercepts, the alphas. A little alpha over on the left end, but otherwise the alphas are all remarkably close to zero with T statistics that are all close to zero. And this time we don't even reject the hypothesis that they are all equal to zero. So look at what we've done. We've used the Fama and French model to understand a different anomaly, an anomaly that by itself had nothing to do with size and book to market. Have we shown in this table that the slow sales companies are themselves value stocks? No. 
What we've shown is that the slow sales stocks behave like value stocks. When the value stock returns go down, all these, all these bad sales companies, their stocks go down as well. They probably are value stocks. The good way to have a low price is to have your sales decline. But the evidence in the table is just that they behave like value stocks. Therefore, what does that mean for you as an investor? Well, buying them, the expected return that looked like such a great thing, a, stra a great strategy relative to the CAPM, it doesn't give you any advantage over just buying HML, over just buying value stocks. Does that mean we've explained the sales growth puzzle? Well, we've explained the sales anomaly given the value premium. The value premium is over on the right-hand side. If the value premium doesn't make any economic sense, neither does the sales premium. But what we've learned is that this is not a new dimension of risk. This is another way of getting another, an old dimension of risk. The three-factor model puts order in the zoo of anomalies and says, look, this one, you may, may or may not have understood the value premium, but the sales growth anomaly is just another way of capturing the value premium. And so is not something new. It's not something worth paying a manager to do for you. It's, it's, it's explained to that extent by its beta.